This predates the virus by about 15 years. I was in university and an acquaintance invites me to join a game his friend runs. They book a study room in the library. We show up and most of the group is already there. One guy is wearing a mask. Not like a character or a monster or anything, just like a white mask. Think like Phantom of the Opera except covering his whole face. Just a plain, neutral face. I assume he's just being silly before the game, and don't really take special note of it. My friend introduces us around. When he gets to Maskey, he says, and this is the GM. When I try to get a proper introduction, the GM insists he only be known as GM, or Game Master. He explains that in order to enhance immersion, he will wear his mask and only go by his title or the name of whatever NPC he is currently playing. This allows us to more easily connect with his game. He insists that this is a method that the best Game Masters use, and I'm lucky, since I have no knowledge of his true face or identity to distract me. Everyone else is acting like this is completely reasonable, so I shrug it off when we start the game. Honestly, that's pretty much the story. The game itself is pretty normal, just the GM wearing a mask and people say things like, can I roll to intimidate the gnome game master? He kept it on the entire time and drank water via a straw and would slide it under the mask. In case you were wondering, the mask was incredibly distracting and did not help me lose myself in the game. I never went back and never saw the GM's real face that I know of. Well, this is definitely not something I think actually works, nor would I recommend doing this. If GM's group is having a good time, then I honestly think that's great, though I think that OP specifically might want to find another game. This happened two years ago on Roll20, and is about the worst game slash most anti-player DM I've ever had. The game started off with the party as slaves aboard a ship. Not a bad start, but the DM had the slavers sell all of our starting equipment, which at level 3 is kinda devastating. We somehow managed to fight our way off the ship, only for our monk to get their leg blown off in the process. Oh yes, see, this DM used his incredibly punishing critical injuries table that had something like a 40% chance of being dismemberment if you were crit. Now this wouldn't have been so bad, as the game was described as roleplay heavy, except the DM either kept throwing combat encounters at us or made the combat the only way to deal with problems. So we get off the ship to freedom only to be immediately arrested and made into debt slaves for the crime of not having a passport, and our bounty set an exorbitant price of 5,000 gold pieces. Again, we were level 3. To add insult to injury, our characters were fitted with bomb collars around our necks that would explode if we tried to remove them or traveled more than 5 miles from the city. But don't worry, it's not real slavery, said our DM. Besides, we could also pay off our debt by undertaking these incredibly deadly tasks, which almost certainly would result in death or more dismemberment. Fun. Even better, every, and I quite literally mean every NPC that the party met was either a complete asshole and openly rude, hostile or condescending to the party for no reason, or was having the most horrible, messed up stuff done to them like being thrown into lava, which the DM laughed as he described, or being killed in the middle of the street. Oh, not everyone's like this, our DM insisted when we complained, and it's like, when every NPC we met is like this, they kind of are. Things came to a head after five sessions that made me leave, if everyone else hadn't already made me want to. An orphan boy we met, whose parents were just viciously executed in front of him, asked us to escort him to a nearby covent to be raised by the nuns. When we arrived, the DM described us hearing the screaming of a young girl from the basement, but when we inquired about it, the nuns were incredibly vague and just told us not to worry about it. During the night, the orphan wakes the party and tells us they have a young tiefling girl held captive in the basement and begs us to go rescue her. We investigate and the girl is held in a small cell with a force field emanating from an upright staff on the door. We try asking the girl why she's imprisoned, she's similarly vague, like the nuns, and refuses to give us a straight answer. Then the mother superior finds us and tells us over and over again that the girl is a demon, with no further elaboration, but also that, being a pacifist, she won't stop us if we attempt to free her. We decided to leave well enough alone, which clearly irritated the DM, as he then describes the orphan boy, removing the staff from the ground and freeing the girl, only for them to both transform into the demon lords of war and tyranny in this setting and teleport away. The mother superior is now suddenly all talk, blaming the party and saying it's all our fault, as the DM believed that too, that her order broke the oath of pacifism years ago to capture the demon and that we were now responsible for recapturing the demons. 
Looking back, the DM had clearly intended for the party to free the demon and then reveal it to us in an epic twist, gotcha moment, but everything about it was just so contrived and made no sense. Why did the demon lord even need us there to free his kin? Why couldn't the nuns just be upfront in the first place so we'd leave the girl alone? Why would the nuns be willing to break their vow of pacifism to capture the female demon lord but not to contain her? Why did they have such a crappy prison where literally anyone, let alone another demon lord, could just walk in, grab the staff, and free her in a pinch. How in the hell was the nuns failing their guard our fault? How the hell were a party of level 3s meant to capture two demon lords? For that matter, how were we meant to do anything when we were still slaves? This contrived bullshit was the last straw for me and I left before the next session. Fuck you, bearfish. Ah uh, yes, another dungeon master that thinks just making your players lose means you are a good dungeon master. Now, don't get me wrong, there is a lot of loss in Dungeons & Dragons. In many campaigns, loss is going to be a major factor, and that is natural. You are rolling dice with ones on them, you are going to lose sometimes. However, on the other hand of that, you need to succeed as well. The losses make the successes more meaningful. There's a reason why the second act of many movies has the bad guys close in trope, because they want to make the final victory in the third act more satisfying. Saving that little girl and that orphan boy could have been the hero's call for the party, but instead the DM wanted it to be a gotcha moment because... Funny, I guess? The DM achieves nothing by winning because they control the game. You should be helping your party to not just win, but to have fun in general. And this campaign, it's the opposite of fun. Alright, so this is the story. I've been hesitating to post this one because the star of the story is an active player and a member of World 20 as I've seen her signing up for other games and even trying to DM some. No idea if she frequents Reddit or this subreddit and considering her personality, I think she might throw a fit if she sees this, but screw it, I'm a bored man and it's been a long time since I posted here since I practically have posted on all the other horror stories I've gathered in my 15 years of playing TTRPGs. About one year ago, I joined a game over at World 20 that emphasized heavy roleplay and story. It was a homebrew world with the DM having his own map, lore, kingdoms, factions, and all that other good jazz. We have session zero and everything seems great. I had high, high expectations for this game because everyone seemed to be of the same mindset of playing a serious roleplay narrative focused game with players that would almost never miss sessions. As you may know, it's incredibly difficult to find players who would show up weekly in a consistent manner. The star of the story is Miranda, divine sword sorcerer, the chosen one of all goodness and light, 15 year old naive teenage girl out to destroy evil after her father wanted her to become some political breeding wife and she left home in anger. I am a human fighter, gruff mercenary man in his 40s that has seen some crap in his years of service as a soldier in the various wars fought by the kingdoms across the land and knight in sour armor. The other players are wizard female half elf slacker who was kicked out by her family for being a hold up in the home all day and refusing to do any work, warlock tiefling haunted by some kind of big bad monster and wants to free himself, and half-elf female bard who I think just want to travel and make stories. Miranda was a problem. While she was most definitely a heavy role player, she had to role play everything. Waking up in the morning, taking a bath, changing clothes, waking everyone up and greeting them, eating breakfast, chatting about how everyone slept, having to discuss the current party plan that had been already discussed previously. And then finally, after like two to three hours, we get to leave the damn tavern slash inn we were sleeping in for the quest we wanted to undertake. This had the unfortunate effect of delaying every game by about one to two hours, and she never seemed to notice the DM and other players becoming weary and wanting to press on. I, who after a few games of noticing this after game, talked with the group and said we should try to make sessions go a little faster, to which Miranda replied, no, this was a heavy roleplay game, right? If I wanted to just do combat, I wouldn't have joined this game that specifically said it was roleplay and narrative focused. Even when I tried to tell her that we should go a little faster so she would actually tackle the story, she adamantly said no, and when all the other party members said we should, she pouted and said she would try. Her need to roleplay everything never changed. 
Miranda also needed to be the center of everything. When she wasn't taking an hour for herself during roleplay sessions, she was barging in on another character's roleplay moments and was inside probably 90% of scenes when other characters were trying to do their own thing. In my case, the party had recovered an ancient artifact inside a deep forest to return to the group of forest elves, and during a tavern roleplay session, a cloaked woman had approached me. The two of us drank and chatted, and she offered double payment for the artifact and said the elves should not be trusted. To which before I even get to reply, Miranda enters in the private chat immediately and tells the cloaked woman, Be gone, rogue! We will not betray our employers and break trust! I don't even get to protest her barging in and how I had specifically was talking to the cloaked woman in the corner before she threatens the cloaked woman with a fight and forces her to leave. I am very frustrated, but not wanting to roll back and spend some more time here, I let it go. Of course, the elves used the artifact to summon forest creatures and all sorts of fey creatures to destroy a nearby human town they hated, an act which the lawful good Miranda said was none of our business. In Warlock's case, sometime mid-campaign, he had a huge character moment where he finally confronted his evil patron of another dimension, and it was his character spotlight. The rest of us cannot enter this other dimension, so we wait while the DM and Warlock do their thing in the private channel. But Miranda, oh no, she cannot wait with the rest of us. She needs to take the spotlight as well and tells the DM she prays hard to her goddess to allow her inside the dimension. The DM lets her roll a D100, and she now nabs a 90 and screams, yes, yeah, hell yeah, I'm doing this. So Diem lets her inside the other dimension, and as far as I understand it, Miranda stole the spotlight as she confronted the big evil patron, supposedly protecting Warlock, and when they came back, she was now converting Warlock to her patron. Warlock somehow still retained his powers, I don't know how. And lastly, Miranda hated it when she wasn't doing well in combat. Anytime she was throwing guiding bolts, killing enemies, and wrecking shit, she was always giddy and screaming at the top of her lungs. I had to specifically lower her to 50% on chat because it was killing my ears. However, when the dice weren't going her way, she would start cursing, pouting, complaining. If enemies ever knocked her down, she would passive-aggressively whine, going, Jeez, I guess I can't do anything but make a death save. This is so fun. And when she did poorly in combat, it affected her decision-making, such as the time when I told an enemy mercenary band that had been working for slavers to drop their arms when we were winning the encounter. They did, and Miranda, lawful good, decided to kill them all. To which I questioned her decision making, and her reply was, Lawful good? To which, after the session, the other players out of character said Miranda seemed psychotic because her character, being a 15 year old girl, was slaughtering people who were surrendering. To which Miranda got upset and said she knew what she was doing, and she was a veteran of these games. And we all dropped it because she was writing multiple paragraphs in the Discord about how she didn't do anything wrong. All of her behavior culminated in the fight that would destroy the campaign. We had tracked down the slaver slash cult leader and attacked her base. Long story short, we killed a dozen mooks, several NPCs with character classes, and were finally confronted by the big bad evil wizard woman. The DM described how a dark aura permeates around her and tells us no mercy will be given to us. By this point, it was the five of us, some down a few percentage of our HP, some resources spent against the slaver wizard, and an apprentice NPC that she had, and maybe some other NPC mercenaries. It was going to be a tough, but from what I could tell, doable fight. Now, Miranda had done semi-poorly this fight, missed a lot of guiding bolts, had one of her fireballs counterspelled, and had practically used all of her resources. She was complaining and whining as the usual. And like I said, her decision making was compromised because when the big bad evil wizard woman came before us, she immediately grabbed wizard and dimension doored out with her last spell slot. This was the point where I was like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, I think we're about to die if you do this. Miranda firmly states, we had no chance in this fight. I told her my fighter is currently on haste, still had several of his battle master maneuvers, and still had his action surge, and that I was about to go all out on the enemy apprentice, which I was certain was going to kill her, making the fight go to 5v2. Miranda argues, well, that's if you roll well. You're assuming a lot of things. I'm making the best decision for everyone. Besides, it's all already happened. I ask Wizard if she allows Miranda to dimension door her because it requires consent, and because Miranda and Wizard had started a romantic relationship, Wizard hesitantly replies, 
Yeah, I think in character, she has no reason not to consent. So yeah, Miranda and the wizard teleport 500 feet away. My turn comes up and the party decides, we have no choice but to flee too. Because I'm still on haste by the wizard, I get to bolt right out of the enemy base. Bard and Warlock are not so lucky. Big bad enemy wizard casts Incinerate on Bard and vaporizes her to dust, to which I am slamming my head on the desk because our wizard had portent. 118 roll she had saved up. She could have given Bard the save she needed. Warlock is hold person by the enemy apprentice and the rest is history. They both die. So the session ends and there's an awkward atmosphere. I ask the DM if the fight was winnable and he tells me yes, it was definitely winnable. The apprentice and mercenary enemies were not that tough. Warlock chimes in. Well, I guess mistakes happen. And Miranda goes absolutely defensive. She argues angrily that there was no mistake. She made the best decision given the circumstances. There are some back and forth arguments between Miranda and the players about why the DM would just outright kill the party in an unwinnable fight, why she couldn't listen to my protest, whether Miranda's decision was a mistake or not. The party is trying to be very polite about all this, but Miranda sounds like she's on the verge of crying. She ends up quitting the Discord. Having invested about 25 or so sessions into this game, it is decided that we end the game here, as understandably, Having three fifths characters now gone in the story is kind of an awkward spot. Bard and Warlock really don't feel like re-rolling new characters. We suggest starting a new game and the DM says he could think of something, but like all things, the channel slowly died out and the game ended. Miranda has left a bad taste in my mouth. I think the lesson here is I need to be more assertive when it comes to addressing problematic behavior and that stubbornness and refusing to admit mistakes can end a game. Cheers to finally having gotten a horror story in my retinue after I told all my past ones. Spotlight hogging comes up a lot. It's a pretty common problem, and I think it comes up more than RPG horror stories make it out to be because a lot of spotlight hogging isn't that big of a deal. It's not really that big of a horror story because, again, it's usually unintentional. Just people who are very extroverted accidentally walking over people without realizing it. However, this is not that. This is not an accident. Miranda is doing this on purpose, and yeah, that can absolutely happen. That is something that I have seen in Dungeons & Dragons games. Some people actively go into D&D wanting to be the main character and that is a serious issue because it's not what D&D is about. The whole group, the entire party are the main characters together. That is the purpose of playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's a party based story. So when you have one main character trying to steal the spotlight and everything, it really ruins the game. On top of that, Miranda has a bitter point of view on combat too. Look, failures are going to happen. You're rolling dice with ones on them. It's going to happen. Getting unreal reasonably upset when that inevitably goes down, well, that's just gonna make the game unfun because this is a game and it's not fun to just be upset. How this group survived 25 sessions, I do not know, but I wish them best of luck in their future D&D endeavors. I was talking about D&D &D with a bunch of guys from a gaming group and they seemed interested in wanting to give it a try. And then someone said they were an experienced DM and would DM a 3.5 edition game for us. So we made a bunch of low level characters and the DM said it was a sandbox game and told us that we started in a tavern. I asked why we were there and he said, I don't know, come up with something. Most of the players were new to D&D &D and were confused. They roleplayed eating for a bit, stopped and just looked at each other. I told the DM that most of the group were new to D&D &D and had no idea what to do, but he kept talking about how it was a sandbox game, like Skyrim. Eventually, he rolled some dice, consulted a chart, and said that there was a bandit game we could go after. So we left the tavern and he rolled more dice. Suddenly, there was a massive storm and we couldn't go after the bandits. We were about to return to the tavern and he suddenly said, we stumbled into an extra dimensional maze and we couldn't get out. We explored the maze for a bit and fought some human enemies. I don't know why, but the DM was taking absolutely forever to move the enemies. It was like five minutes or more just to have one guy move and attack with a sword. One round of combat was taking at least 30 minutes. After about two to three rounds of this, the DM suddenly said he was bored and wanted to do something else. The maze was Cthulhu's birth canal and our party died when we were ejected through it. Part 2. Then, another guy offered to DM for us. He also claimed to be an experienced DM and had this amazing homebrew setting and plot all ready to go. But instead of setting a starting level, he just told us to use whatever we wanted, and he would work around it. 
So we made characters on another day, and the XDM promptly made some ridiculous dual-wielding gunslinger character that rode a magic bike with infinite ammo that could full attack for 100 plus damage per round. It wasn't even from a stat block, he just made everything up. The DM glanced at his character sheet, didn't even bat an eyelid, and just started talking about how mages could do more damage anyway, which the XDM enthusiastically agreed with. Most of the remaining characters were normal, except for one guy who wanted to play, and I I quote, a literal his words, not mine. His character was just a drooling dude that followed the party around and did nothing but occasionally roleplayed the drooling, picking his nose and things like that. He also had no backstory as to why his character was in our party. So we started playing, and the DM had a start in a tavern. I thought he was joking after the previous fiasco, but nope. Again, there was no explanation as to why our party was there, but he told us to go and get a quest. So the ex-DM stomped over to the barkeep and demanded a quest, which was to retrieve a MacGuffin. Yes, the DM actually called it a MacGuffin. We went into some forest, fought some enemies, and retrieved the MacGuffin. But this one fight actually took most of the session because the DM was extremely slow in moving the enemies, and he kept stopping to tell us stories of his workplace, which often included swearing about how his customers were stupid and anecdotes about how he saved the day. Next session, we handed the MacGuffin to the barkeep and got another quest to investigate some mysterious masked men that kept appearing in town. The DM kept gushing about how this was the good part, how the masked men were integral to his homebrew settings plot, and how we would love it. The party agreed to split up. One group would try and follow the masked men, the other group would try to gather information from the locals. I was in the ladder group and ended up basically doing all the role playing because the rest were just doing nothing at all. The locals knew nothing, but a group of drunkards picked a fight with my player character. The party members who were with me chose to just watch and wouldn't lift a finger. One guy's explanation was that he wanted to watch me fight them. The guy playing the drooling dude chose to role play more drooling. The session ended there. I asked where the plot is because in three sessions, we haven't seen anything of it. He just shushed me and told me to be patient. After the DM finished bragging about how amazing the masked men were, I asked the remaining party members what they wanted to do. Nobody wanted to do anything, so we just let the masked men leave and move the unconscious party members back to our rooms. And then one guy decided to roleplay pushing the unconscious party members. <sighs> Nobody else seemed bothered by this, or maybe they just didn't care anymore. I asked the other players if they had any ideas on how to continue the plot. Nobody seemed interested. I don't think the campaign got much farther, and I stopped talking to these guys after this. We're not going to talk about that last thing, because that's just bad and I don't need to explain it. We're also not going to talk about the middle school tier humor of Mr. McDrool, so let's talk about the DMs. Look, I don't really care if you're experienced, I just care that you're good. That's all that matters. And these DMs are not exactly what I would call good at their jobs. Look, Sandbox is great, but it's interesting that they use Skyrim as the comparison, because yeah, Skyrim is open world. You can go anywhere, do whatever, but Skyrim still has quests for you to go on that are presented by the game. Hell, even Minecraft has more direction with their advancements. These DMs just want the party to make something up for them, and when you're talking to new players, they're just not gonna know what to do. I'm not gonna judge a DM for hyping up their quest or their bad guy or whatever because I do that too, but you also need to deliver. I don't hype something up before it interests the players. Like right now, there's a massive twist being set up in my second campaign, and the players are really, really invested, and therefore, I'm hyping it up a little bit because I know that they care. The second DM's masked men? I mean, really, why would the party even be invested? And that's the issue. D&D needs investment, something this campaign just doesn't have. Thankfully, this story isn't as bad as it could have been, and it's a good lesson for me in setting firm boundaries. I'm a very experienced Pathfinder player. I've been playing since it was released. One of my IRL friends is DMing a Roll20 game, and I play in it. I am very willing to help new players and make myself available to them to help with character creation. We had one player join creep who needed a lot of help. At first, it was fine and I was willing to spend a few hours before the game going over things and teaching him how to use Roll20, except he never learned. Every single time we leveled, I had to help him. He started getting creepy towards me. He started getting very upset anytime I curse, but not when a man cursed. Every time he'd make a comment about how a lady like you shouldn't use such language. 
He asked me for pictures and got pouty when I told him no. He flirted with me in a sexually aggressive manner, both in and out of character. I'm married, and I'm very open about that fact. I don't make it like a big thing, I just can only play after a certain time because I need to get dinner ready. Creep would get jealous when I mentioned doing something for or with my husband, and he'd get pouty if I said I couldn't respond in chat because I was with him. He messaged me constantly and expected me to always answer. I tried to explain that I have work and school and a life, but he'd always get really upset if I didn't answer within half an hour. He finally got called out by multiple people about his creepy and sexually aggressive flirting. He played the victim and said it's my fault for overreacting to compliments. He left the group because he couldn't find any support and everyone's calling him out. He then threatened to mm -hmm. to the one person still talking to him. He genuinely believes that he has the right to say any Anything he wants to me and that I don't have the right to limit contact or refuse contact completely. He thinks I am overreacting and making a big deal out of nothing. Okay, I know what you're thinking. This is really bad. And you're right. This is really bad. But don't worry. It gets worse. Update. He's on the <laughs> registry and is currently on parole, having been released from prison a few years ago. Thankfully, he doesn't know anything about me. He knows my nickname, which is super common. Think Pat or Sam for Patricia or Samantha. He doesn't even know what state I'm in. Just that I complain about the heat. I'm still gaming, but I am very nervous. Every time I get a call I don't recognize, I get scared. I've given his name to people I trust, so if anything did happen, word would very quickly get out. Sadly, this very quickly went beyond an internet creeper since he started desperately trying to get my real name, my address, and phone number. He did not get any information, thankfully, has been blocked and server banned. This has gone beyond RPG Horror Story. This is something that belongs on the next Po channel. I wish OP the best and hope that she stays safe in this situation because yeah, this is something that is absolutely terrifying. A lot of people play these TTRPG games and some of those people are bound to be the worst of the worst. Stay safe out there, everyone. I'm not saying that you need to tediously background check everybody, but keep an eye out for warning signs. And if you see something that makes you uncomfortable, do not brush it off. Don't just let that slide because it could be a sign for things to come. I'm not saying to be paranoid every time you play D&D because I think that's going to make the game less fun. But I am saying to keep yourself safe everyone because that is what matters in the end. And that's where we are going to end today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed it, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out our Tabletop Tavern Tip series, where we give advice for both DMs and players, old and new. And while you're there in the card, subscribe to Crispy Tavern to get more of our content right as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment real horror to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.